Hi, I'm Kendra Abbott and I work at the Alabama Museum of Natural History. And I'm John Abbott and I am Director of Research and Collections for the University of Alabama Museums. Uh, and we're standing here about 10 miles west of Tuscaloosa. We're in our backyard where we regularly blacklight. What's blacklighting? Blacklighting is where you use a, a black light or a light bulb in the ultraviolet spectrum. In our case, we use a mercury vapor bulb um, to attract insects. They see that wavelength of light and they're drawn to it. Uh, and so we have this set up in our backyard so we can uh, regularly come out every night and see, see what kind of insects are drawn to it. Yeah, and you may hear mm. some chickens in the background. I just realized that they're walking around the camera making a lot of noise. So, mm. so um, there are lots of ways that you can um, blacklight. Uh, we have a very elaborate setup here, very permanent. Um, but you can um, do anything from this to just turning your porch light on and keeping your porch light on all night. So it doesn't have to be super high tech. Um, we often also will go out in the field and just set up a sheet um, with like tent stakes and put a light on that. Yeah, and um, so we've just moved to Alabama. Uh, just, we've been here that we're going on six years. And one thing, we moved from Texas, and one thing that really struck us is the abundance of insects here. I mean, when we blacklight for insects, I mean, <laughs> this can be chocked full of bugs. Um, so uh, it's, it's a really great place to be if you're interested in insects, and you can get some really cool stuff and even new species of science if you really work hard at it. So one thing about this year that we've noticed is that we've had a lot of weird weird weather. So we've had this really late freeze and then literally last night we had a giant hail storm. Is our black light going to make it? <laughs> so that a lot can of severe weather this year. Yeah, so uh, it's really knocked our insects back. So we thought it would be fun to compare what we can get at our light uh, here in Tuscaloosa, Alabama to uh, what you can get in other parts of the world. And so we reached out to a couple of our friends. Uh, one of them is Peter Nesrecki, who is at the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Center in Gorongosa National Park in Mozambique, Africa, Southern Africa. Um, and then we asked our friend Nancy Murelli, who is in Ecuador. She lives in Quito and actually does bug tours all over Ecuador, um, if she would also blacklight uh, for us and see, and we can compare what she gets um, with what we get here. So um, it has been a weird year and it's been a weird year for uh, Nancy as well uh, with COVID in Ecuador. And so I'll let her explain um, her situation with blacklighting. Hello, love bugs. I am so excited to show you some footage of a mercury vapor light bulb. So just for transparency's sake, this footage is not particularly new. I was supposed to go down this week to be in the Amazon and get some new footage for y'all. However, due to the curfew that was in, put in place because of COVID and also because of our voting got changed, Ecuador is a little bit complicated. The week that I was supposed to go down to the Amazon shifted by a week. So I did not get to go down yet and do that footage for y'all. So you are going to see some footage that I actually took live at the time in December from the cloud forest. So I hope you enjoy seeing some cloud forest bugs and all right, roll footage. So yeah, let's get to it. Let's see what everybody's got at their black light. Um, hi, welcome from uh, Gorongosa National Park in Mozambique. I just wanted to give you a, a very quick uh, overview what, uh, what you can find here at the light. Uh, it's the beginning of the rainy season, so everything is exploding, and we have millions of things. So I thought tonight, um, I am in the cloud forest right now because I was called in to be a fairy, hence the makeup, which and the costume has been taken off. I wanted to show you the black light and what we're getting so far, and like talk to you about some of the things that are here on the sheet behind me. So as you can tell, it's very bright. <laughs> and so there's stuff. And we are going to talk about the stuff. Um, here, I'm at El Septimo Paraiso in Mindo, Ecuador. By the way, I feel like I should mention that. So while uh, Peter and Nancy are um, far away from us, you know, in different continents, uh, we still actually have a lot of similarity in the bugs that we find. Um, they are 
they obviously live in very tropical places and uh, their bugs represent the tropical biodiversity but i think here in alabama we have uh, we have we sh we have a good showing of a tropical looking bugs that we have here. Yeah. It's, uh, giant uh, hydrophilids, uh, sarunids, uh, velostomatids, cerambicids. Uh, it's a fantastic, uh, huge cicadas, um, dynastines. Uh, take a pick. It's it's probably I would say a thousand species or so at this light right now. Uh, it's phenomenal. Um, here is a Rothschildia moth. This is in the family Saturniidae, and this this moth uh, will only live for about a week because it doesn't have a mouth, and so it actually can't eat anything. And this is a male. He's actually pretty small, so for this genus and species, he's a little bit small. That's how one of the ways I can tell he's a male, and also he has really fluffy antennae, and so that's one of the other ways that I can tell that he is a male. I'm trying to find... It's like, balance between finding things that are cool and also big enough that if my quality goes down you can still see it all right so some of the things that that they both saw were saturnid moths we have lots of saturnid moths here as well uh, this year already we've gotten uh what four different species uh, luna moths polyphemus uh, rosy maple and uh, tulip tree silk moths um, and we'll get, you know, just in the next week or two, we'll probably pick up that many, again, uh, species. Um, it's not unusual to have a dozen species of, of uh, giant silk moths actually, uh, you know, on our uh, sheet uh, in, just in one night. Yeah, mm -hmm. and if you keep your porch light on, this is uh, the Luna Moth, is uh, you will almost certainly be able to get a Luna Moth at some point during the summer if you do that. This is a big hawk moth. These are really, really important for the pollination here. And these guys have really long tongues. Some of them can have tongues that are two to three times their body length, and they pollinate very specific flowers here. That, um, and so they have really long tongues to be able to fit into those flowers. And they're really important nocturnal pollinators. It's cold right now, and so when they get scared and want to fly away, they don't. their wing muscles aren't kind of like awake enough yet to do that, so they will sit and they will vibrate their wings to get enough oomph to be able to fly. Yeah, and like uh, uh, Nancy was saying, you know, these, these sphinx moths, you can see these really long quilled uh, proboscis, uh, the, the mouth parts, so basically a big straw. Um, you, you, ours have those, and the, the Saturnias, like the Luna Moth, lack mouth parts, just like she was talking about. Yep, so we're very <clears> similar <throat> in that way. I wish you guys were here and uh, were able to experience this incredible richness of, uh, of insect biodiversity. Peter, we wish we were there too. Hopefully sure. we get to see you soon. This is a really beautiful, also Tiger Moth, you'll see a lot of these Tiger Moths have these bright colors, and that's because they're toxic. And again, they're not toxic to us, they're toxic to birds, but they have the, usually alkaloids, which are a lot of different poisons. And so a lot of them also have these really bright colors, are like have these toxins in their blood. These large moths, like they really like to come out the later in the night, the better it is for them. You can have a lot, you can see a lot of these moths are just like these really pretty kind of camouflage colors. Um, this thing is also is another type of, this is actually a geometrid moth. Again, it doesn't have a name. I call it the leopard moth, but no one cares what I call it. Uh, it's also really pretty. Again, this guy, that's the, that's the flannel moth guy. Uh, this guy is like a little camouflaged bloody. Uh, what is this? Oh, this is a phenomenal uh, hydrophilic. Um, what else do we have here? Crickets. This is probably an undescribed species of, of uh, Teleogrillus. Here we have a Duronia. Um, can we look at that thing? There's a, there are, these are wings of, of uh, Macrothermes, a giant uh, Mozambican termite. Uh, they, they come to light, they shed their wings, and then they start, um, uh, they start their, their own uh, colonies. And that is something we actually experienced when we went to visit him in Mozambique, is uh, all of these termites all over the place. And we were lucky enough for him to take us out and actually find a termite mound, and we were able to photograph some of the different um, casts cast members of the of the termite mound yeah and uh we uh, are having emergencies right now uh of termites uh it's typically not something that is celebrated uh here in in the you know southern united states because it may indicate you know that you have a termite infestation in your house for example which is of course not good 
Um, we live in uh, the woods. Uh, you can hear the woodpecker just there. Uh, and um, we, we've got termites all over the place. Uh, the the um, eastern subterranean termite or uh, reticula termites flavipes. And they're emerging right now. We were just walking around yesterday and they were, uh, you know, a, a large nuptial flight uh, taking off. And I will get uh, termites coming uh, to the light, um, sometimes in pretty good numbers. Yeah. Uh, might have last night. We would have, yeah. If we hadn't yeah. had a hail you know, storm. large hail storm. Yeah. I was actually pretty mm -hmm. excited since Peter had all of those termites at his black light. I was like, oh, good, we can show all the, all the termites at ours. And then we had a hail storm. <laughs> so, so. This, uh, Katie did here. This, this thing here. Um, that's uh, Ruspolia consabrina. That's an edible species. It's actually quite delicious. Uh, people eat them here quite regularly. Um, so Peter, uh, when next time we come to visit Mozambique, hopefully we'll bring a whole bunch of folks from the University of Alabama and the Tuscaloosa area. And I want to try one of those Katie dids the next time we visit. Um, I have been known to make my own a uh, spread of insects uh, for humans to consume. Uh, I will show you a picture of some of the things that I have, I have made. Good stuff. Yeah. So next time, definitely, we will. Uh, we we need to try some of those very good Katie dids that you pointed out. Right here, we have a, a female of a dynastine beetle. Um, yeah, it's awesome. It's tons of tons of really good stuff probably a little different than uh, what you'll find in uh, Alabama, but uh, um, equally interesting. So he's like a lofa, and I will put him on the ground and I will flip the camera around so hopefully we can, we can all enjoy his presence. There he is. Anyway, so he has like, normally they have bigger horns, like way in the front, a big one. And, uh, but I think this is just a male that didn't get a lot of nutrition as as a baby, as a larva. So one thing that's really interesting is like the horns. Again, this guy is really small. They're usually like way up here. When, when larva and they don't eat enough, they get these really small horns. And so they can't push other males around as easily. And when they can't do that, then they don't compete as well for females. Peter and Nancy both mentioned uh, seeing dynastines at their lights. So these are uh, you know, a prized subfamily of scarabs, um, scarab beetles that people like because these are the rhinoceros beetles. These are oftentimes, you know, really ornamented, large males have big, large horns. And we get a lot of uh, dynastines here as well. Um, uh, there's, oh, I don't know how many species, but quite a number of species uh, that we'll get uh, throughout the year here. Some of them, rel you know, relatively large, uh, especially for beetles uh, around here, some of the largest beetles we have. Uh, males with pretty good horns sometimes. Most of them are, br you know, brownish uh, in color, but uh, sometimes there's a, you the know, other colors, a little bit of green in the, the dynasties that we have, yeah. Yeah. Um, and they like to mm. actually, the larvae of some of the species like to live in your compost pile or your mulch pile. Yeah. So if you have uh, either of those, you might find large grubs in there, and those are uh, usually a dynasty. Um, here's that ichneumonid wasp again. Um, we had a male, I guess they went to sleep already. We had a male of this weird group called the Pelicinidae. Oh, yeah, here we go. So the Pelicinidae. The females look like this, except they have a really long tail that curves like that. And you see them during the day, and they lay their eggs in leaf litter and look for beetle larvae. There he is. <laughs> um, and look for beetle larvae. Um, in the states, they're considered to be parthenogenic, so the females are just rep reproducing clones of themselves. So I think in the tropics is the only place where you can find the males. So that's, I don't know, I think that's cool. So, yeah, this is an... Another parasitic wasp of some sort. I'm not sure which one. Hey. Oh, this guy's pretty. Oh. Butter, 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 butter. <laughs> A really cool species of wasp that uh, Nancy mentions as well is pelicinid wasps. Really uh, distinctive because the female has this incredibly long, thin abdomen. And they're very common uh, here in, in Alabama. Um, you especially find them in, in forested situations. 
Um, the males, uh, they're sexually dimorphic. Uh, Nancy points out a, a male that came to her light. And what that, what that means is that the males look very different from females. That's what sexually dimorphic means. It means the male and the female look very different. Uh, and the males are very rare uh, here in the States. Um, still a lot of research needs to be done, but as Nancy was saying, they are... Um, most of the populations uh, appear to be parthenogenetic, but we do have males in the States. There, Every now and then, uh, one will be collected in a malaise trap or photographed or something like that. Well, there's not very much information on the males in general, so it's certainly something that if you're interested in finding new discoveries, that is one that needs to be discovered. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> there's some very... Uh skilled insect collectors here. Uh, we have a family of warthogs here. They don't care about the insect stuff. So uh, while Peter showed a, a few uh, uh, competitors, I guess you will, uh, for, you know, at the light that he has to deal with, uh, I occasionally have to deal with things as well. Uh, you know, possums um, uh, be probably the most common. Occasionally I'll see a raccoon out. Bats are quite common. They'll come down real low. Uh, Eastern red bats in particular will come down real low. Um, and, you know, just pretty much right over my head as things as I'm sitting here collecting and looking at things. Uh, they'll, they'll be um, taking things right out of the air. So we hope that you enjoyed seeing these various blacklight setups in different parts of the world and being able to compare and contrast the different bugs that we have um, and maybe the different competitors that we have <laughs> at our blacklights uh, at night. And um, Encourage you to flip on your porch light yeah, and absolutely. see what kind of insects come to uh, wherever you live. And if you get something cool, let us know. Absolutely. To support this program, please consider donating to the Alabama Museum of Natural History Program's gift fund by visiting BamaBugFest.org and clicking Support at the top of the page.